So firstly, I just want to thank Dave and his amazing staff for putting this all together. Uh, this has been a totally kick-ass conference. I think we can all agree, especially the folks who've been here for a while. So how about a quick round of applause for these folks? And uh, Dave, thanks so much for having me on. Um, as Dave said, you might know me from the podcasting world. I know I, I've talked to a lot of you folks out here, and you're just like, oh, you're, you're able. That's awesome. Like, thanks for being here. And I'm like, yeah, I, I love that. Diet and nutrition is really close to my heart, as is fitness. But this is even closer. I've been a professional musician for uh, over a decade now. Grew up in the backwoods of New Hampshire with uh, no cable television, at times no electricity. What we did have was a heck of a lot of musical equipment lying around the house. So I spent most of my childhood jamming out with my brother, shaking the walls with sound. And I, I think it's influenced me in very profound ways. Um, another quick aside, Dave was talking about aniracetam. I'm on it right now. I've tried a lot of them. I love it. It's awesome. <laughs> totally check it out. Um, so I'm going to talk about music and how you can use its power to actually improve your performance, uh, up your productivity, improve your mood states, as well as, if you're interested in it, look at improving your physical states and physical performance as well. So, some of the most salient memories for me about music, uh, they're just quick examples of, of the power of music. So, when tragedy struck in my teens, fortunately, uh, I had already been a musician for a while. I played a bunch of different instruments. And I've always said that if I didn't have music, I'd be certifiably insane. And I, I stand by that today. Uh, so when tragedy struck, actually my best friend, my cousin, uh, died in a freak car accident. And I remember I tried everything. This is a teenager. I was just as emotionally dumb as anyone else out there. You know, I, I couldn't really access my emotions at all. Um, and so I, I knew that I should cry, and I knew that I needed a release, but there wasn't anything that I could do to, to kind of get that out there. I'm sure a lot of you folks, especially the men, have probably experienced something like that. And so uh, the only thing that worked was running upstairs, locking the door of my room, cranking up my amplifier, and just playing guitar as loud, as hard, and as fast as I could until I literally collapsed in tears. And that's the only way that I could get myself to cry. And I'm like, why is that? that? There must be something to this. And then another interesting uh, aside that, that kind of talks a bit about the power of music is at his funeral, there was a guitar trio that played Here Comes the Sun, the Beatles song, all instrumental. And for years following that, any time I heard that song on the radio or someone singing it, just that simple melody, I get a lump in my throat. That still happens to me today. I'm sure a lot of you folks out there have probably experienced something like this, and you're probably wondering, what, what in the world is going on? So I'm going to try to explain some of the science behind why that happens. So first of all, let me just get a quick <laughs> hand raising. How many folks out there listen to music? <laughs> Raise your hand. Don't be shy. All right. Why? Raise your hand again. Because it moves us. It moves us. Good. Because it makes you happy. That's what I was looking for. Music has uh, this kind of indescribable power over us to make us happy. It puts us in a positive mood state. You can psych up, you can psych down, you can regulate your arousal, you can regulate your mood, your mood to an extent that you really can't with many other modalities. Um, but it's bizarre, isn't it? Because music really has no clear adaptive function. You know, and you need to eat, you need to sleep, uh, procreation, all these. Uh, it, it's very clear from an evolutionary standpoint why we'd be doing this. Um, Music is a little bit bizarre, you know? It's pumped into elevators, uh, it's on soundtracks, people are just putting it in their ears all day, all night. Why? Um, <laughs> and what is music, anyway? So uh, let's do a, a quick little exercise. I'm going to say four words, and uh, if you could raise your hand, just tell me what I'm talking about. Rhythm, pitch, timbre, and melody. Don't be shy, raise your hand. Sure, back there. With the glasses, no? All right, another hand. No, just all of these things together. What am I describing here? 
music. I'm actually talking about language. There's an indelible link between music and language, it turns out, where there are, uh, the way that we process music is extraordinarily similar to the way that we process language. And when you hear instruments, um, there's a lot of evidence that shows that we're processing instruments as super expressive voices. And so when you, when you hear a violin, kind of this, this screeching, obviously it can be a lot faster. Uh, it, it has a higher pitch, but the brain is hearing that as kind of a super expressive voice. And you can hear emotion in it, can't you? You can hear that it's, that it's sad or that it's shrill and it makes your heart beat. It does things to us. And so, just a, a long story short, I cover this a lot in my book if you're interested in the, the biological and evolutionary background of why music exists, but the mechanisms for music and language perception were actually co-opted solutions to more priv primitive auditory problems. So it's, what that means is that like, music didn't come from language and language didn't come from music, but they both co-opted uh, mechanisms that allow us to process auditory sound. And so whether we like it or not, language and music are indelibly linked. And it's important to understand that if you wanna use it to up your, up your performance. Um, another interesting point, our brains are actually wired to perceive music. Animals reared without musical expo exposure demonstrate normal musical perception. What's, what that implies is that it's actually wired and mapped in our brain. Um, music also, interestingly, has a vocabulary and a grammar such that when you violate this, this vocabulary, it becomes noise. It, it's not music anymore. If you hear a cat running around on a piano, that's not musical. It's, it's made up of mu musical tones from the vocabulary of music, but the grammar's wrong, the structure's wrong. It's, it's not music. Um, a really interesting example of this is atonal music, which is 20th century art music, where basically a bunch of academics got together and uh, invented a new music that used, if you look at the piano, there are, within any octave, 11 different tones. And uh, the music that we're used to hearing is of a di diatonic scale. What that means, it's unequal. When you listen to it, do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do, you have, you have the ability to know where you are within that scale. When you, uh, when you use 11 tones, or anything kind of beyond seven even, it's beyond the capacity of our verbal memory. So we no longer have the ability to know where we are musically, it just becomes noise. No one ever really listens to art music except for those academics who are studying it. Interestingly, when you look at the score, it's beautiful. But when you listen to it, it's just an absolute mess. So music actually contains emotional information. Uh, there have been a few really interesting studies. Four-year-olds can actually categorize sung melodies as happy, sad, angry, or frightening. Um, Three-year-olds can categorize music as happy or sad as well. That's, that's pretty young to have any sort of musical intelligence. Um, and, and there was another really fascinating study where maternal singing actually was used to communicate with infants more effectively than language could. And I, I th I'm just gonna talk about this briefly because I, I don't wanna take up too much time. I wanna get you to the, the nuts and bolts, the meats and potatoes of how you can improve your performance. But musical training actually leads to structural changes in the brain. So what we're looking at here is the brain of a musician who has absolute pitch. Has anyone heard of that? Yeah. Perfect pitch, it's also known as perfect pitch. And what that, what that means is, is uh, if a person with perfect pitch hears a G or a C, they know instantaneously that that's what they're hearing. They can also produce that tone at any given time. If they look at a score of music, they can read that music uh, from an absolute perspective. Um, what we all tend to have though, as humans uniquely, is the ability of relative pitch. And what that means is that we can hear a melody. So birds actually have absolute pitch. Um, and, and there's a lot of evidence saying that we're born with the ability to have absolute pitch. Um, the incidence of that ability, however, among Americans is about one in 10,000. It's highly coveted 
in the, in the music world. Beethoven had it, had it, Mozart, Bach, a lot of these folks had it. Um, what, when it gets really interesting is when we're talking about uh, folks who come from tonal languages, who were raised with tonal languages. So Vietnamese and Mandarin is an example of that. When you, when you change the tone of those languages, you change the meaning. The incidence of absolute pitch amongst those folks is one and two, one and three. That's fascinating. So it, just a, a quick hypothesis, a quick hypothesis about that uh, is, is that we all start with it, but it's kind of, it disappears over time if we don't use it um, because we don't need it. It's not quite as effective uh, in terms of listening to either music or speech as is relative pitch. You can hear inflection, and that's very important when it comes to communicating emotional information. And so let's talk a little bit about the upgraded musician. What sort of advantages, this, I was really interested in this one, when I, and this is one of the reasons I kind of got into this field. But what does music do? Like what, what superpowers does it give you? Um, so some studies have shown that you actually have the approved, improved ability to perceive emotional information from speech prosody. And what that means is uh, you can actually hear the emotions behind the words with a higher degree of accuracy than someone who isn't musically trained. So, <laughs> you know, a lot of folks out there refer to, it's, it's not really important about what the words are coming out of the mouth, it's about how they're said. And for any of you guys out there who have asked, you know, your wife or your girlfriend, hey, are, how are you doing, are you mad at me? And she says, no, I'm fine. You, <laughs> you know that it's not the words that matter. It's the emotion behind those words. So. Uh, if you can kind of hone in on, uh, on the emotion behind those words, if you have uh, an increased ability to sense them, it does give a lot of credence to improved social interaction. Conversely, uh, a lot of people when they meet me, they're just like, wow, you have a radio voice. And it's not just because it's low. One of my hypotheses about that is that being a musician for so long, I use, if you listen to my voice, I use inflection in kind of an exaggerated way, don't I? Even though it's low, you, n you never really hear a great radio personality who's monotone, do you? It's, it's all about using inflection to convey emotional information. Uh, another feature of musicians is that brain activity tends to be less lateralized. That means that there's more capacity in the corpus callosum, which facilitates communication between the hemispheres. Um, Musicians are also more likely to be ambidextrous or use the non-dominant hand for things that you wouldn't expect, like opening jars or opening doors, things like that. Um, there's a higher volume of gray matter in the left Heschel's gyrus, which is involved in auditory pro processing. Um, and there have also been generally positive relationships between music and verbal, mathematical, and visual spatial abilities. So here's our friend Michael Phelps. He's, uh, he's a famous example of someone who uses music uh, very routinely before meets. No one really knows why. We imagine that it's probably to psych up, to get himself in the state of high performance. I hear his favorite band is Britney Spears. So how can we use music to, to hack perf performance? Well, music actually elicits a measurable physiological response, whether we're actively listening or passively listening. Um, Oh, what you can see here is changes in blood pressure listening to a fast tempo or a slow tempo in music. So, uh, who we have here is uh, Haile Gabriel, Gabriel Selassie, who matched his cadence famously to the song Scatman, which is a totally ridiculous song. These are actual lyrics from the song. I don't know if any of you folks have ever heard it. I wouldn't recommend that you, that you listen to it. It's, it's awful. But what it allowed him to do was perfectly match his cadence um, to the 135 beats per minute in the song, and then he crushed it, broke a bunch of records, and he's known as one of the greatest distance runners of all time. This is one way that you can use, you can use music. The way that I tend to use music is for arousal regulation. This is actually a picture of my brain from an fMRI. <laughs> so you can utilize music to alter mental, physiological, emotional, and spiritual states. This often leads to increased focus and reduced distractions. So I'd be, for the folks who saw the first uh, presentation this morning, I'd be really interested to see some research on the effects on coherence, especially when you're psyching up 
uh, before a meet or something like that. I'd like to see what that actually looks like. <laughs> so one way that I used it, right out of college to pay off my loans, I worked in consulting for a while. Sometimes I needed to work extraordinarily hard under a lot of pressure, um, produce a lot of work in a short amount of time. The way that I did it was putting on headphones and listening to Dragon Force. I don't know if you guys have ever listened to this, but it has ridiculous dueling guitars, a driving beat, really fast, screaming vocals, and I could get eight hours of work done in an hour, I, I swear. Ran uh, an informal study when, at, when I was at Dartmouth. Um, I'm going to explain it quickly here. The participants, we had them uh, complete a portion of the verbal and the math SATs. It's cruel, I know, but they had to do it. <laughs> they got credit for it. Um, and so we had, we had three different groups. We had one that listened to music, another that listened to identical music with the lyrics removed, and then one no music control. And so what we found was increased speed of taking the test and accuracy in all conditions except one. Any brave soul want to guess which one that was? Control? Yeah, so the control underperformed all of these, but there was another one. Think about the combinations between verbal math and music with lyrics, music without lyrics. What's that? Verbal and lyrics. The reason for that is it's distracting. When you listen to music with lyrics, uh, it interferes with something called a phonological loop. And so if you're, trying to write some, if you're trying to write an email or write a paper or write a research study and you're hearing words in your head, it tends to be distracting. Your performance goes down. That's a really important thing to know. Another way you can use it is disassociation. So during sub-maximal sub exercise, music can actually narrow attention and divert the mind from sensations of fatigue. Anyone who's uh, experienced mile 16 of a marathon can tell you that, that this is very useful. I, I know I always put my headphones on when I got to that, that lag in between, because you a little extra boost takes away from the, uh, the horrible pains that you're experiencing at that point. Um, in a study, the perception of effort under these conditions decreased by 10% when you use disassociation. Amateur running performance increased by 10 to 15%. Um, and this reduction of effort, it's important to note that these effects cease after 85% of VO2 max, although music does improve the experience of that, that situation in those cases. Music can also help reaching uh, reaching the state of flow, which is we're talking about alpha waves in the last presentation. And flow is something that is very important if you want uh, increased consciousness, uh, the ability to relax and, and control what you're doing to an unprecedented degree. There was, a, there was a study of jazz musicians hooked up in an fMRI mach machine impro <laughs> improvising the whole time. I would have loved to see that. Um, I'm, I'm sure they didn't use trumpets. But <laughs> so this is... This is extremely interesting. Look at that beautiful brain. Look at all the activation there. So what they found there is that ventromedial prefrontal cortex activity actually increased, which represents normal risk processing, fear, and decision making. Um, lateral prefrontal cortex activation significantly decreased, which implies a cessation of self-monitoring. So what that means is they experienced fear, but they didn't care. They were beyond it. They could access this, this portion of the ring where they actually were able to let go, channel that energy to improve their performance. How am I doing on time? Three minutes. <laughs> okay. So how can you guys select music to improve your performance? One thing that I would recommend that you do, whether you're hacking your mental or physical performance, is select music that you enjoy. Um, you don't have to love it, but you have to like it. So if, if you don't... If you think that Justin Bieber blows, raise your hand. <laughs> Don't listen to it. It's not going to improve your performance, most likely. Um, so find something that you enjoy. Try to alter the tempo and the feel based upon your goal. If you want to psych up, listen to Eye of the Tiger. If you want to psych down, relax. Listen to reggae. Listen to some blues. It's good stuff. Um, take breaks. You don't want to have music constantly in your ears, in your head, all day. You need to take breaks. Um, very important to maintaining efficacy in that, in that case. Listen to bass and drums, propulsive beats are very helpful. Um, and also find music with and without lyrics. 
And so I think I'm out of time. One more minute. One more minute. Um, Okay, one more thing that you can do, if you do have any musical training, or even if you don't, try to speak with more inflection. Um, it can really help communicate the emotional information in, what, in the words that you're saying. So that's one thing you can do immediately. Just put it to work, try it out. You don't sound as ridiculous as, as you think. Say something with no inflection. Say something with no inflection. Right. That was actually a little inflection at the end. It's, it's hard to do. So, so it's kind of hard to practice, but there's nothing wrong with standing in front of a mirror and making monkey sounds to yourself until you know what your, your mouth is doing and your voice is doing. Uh, as a professional spokesperson, I've done that. In fact, I did it this morning. Not really. <laughs> Abel, thank you, man. Thanks so much. It's a pleasure having you.